All right. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the weekly program series done by the Adams County Historical Society. Thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Abby Huffman, and I am the director of programs with ACHS, and we are so glad to have you here. I know you're going to enjoy the topic for this evening. For those of you that don't know, the Adams County Historical Society, um, the home of the Historical Society itself is in the heart of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And here we're housing about a million artifacts and we're just desperately working on getting them a new home. So if you haven't heard about our new um, museum that's gonna be coming, our new storage for the artifacts, um, we're hoping to have all that and a little bit more information for you as we get into 2023. Um, but if you would like to stay in tune to that, we will. We do have a newsletter and you're welcome to sign up for that at any time. There's also a red heart button on this post. You're welcome to uh, press that if you would like to donate toward our project. Specifically, the donations for this evening help us to keep these Thursday night programs free to the public, which I really like to be able to offer that we have historical programming going on every Thursday night at seven o'clock on our Facebook page and we try to keep it free and accessible. So with that, that brings me to tonight's program, which is titled On a Great Battlefield, The History of Gettysburg National Military Park, 1863 through 2020. And our speaker is Dr. Jennifer M. Murray. So a little bit about Dr. Murray. She is a military historian with a specialization in the American Civil War in the Department of History at Oklahoma State University. Murray's most recent publication is On a Great Battlefield, the Making, Management, and Memory of Gettysburg National Military Park, 1933 through 2013, published by the University of Tennessee Press in 2014. Murray is also the author of The Civil War Begins, published by the U.S. Army Center of Military History in 2012. She is currently working on a full-length biography of George Gordon Meade, tentatively titled Meade at War, which I will add in right there. Sounds amazing. Can't wait to hear about that one. In addition to delivering hundreds of Civil War battlefield tours, Murray has led World War I and World War II study abroad trips to Europe. Murray is a veteran faculty member at Gettysburg College's Civil War Institute and a coveted speaker at Civil War symposiums and roundtables. Additionally, Murray worked as a seasonal interpre interpretive park ranger for the National Park Service at Gass Gettysburg National Military Park for nine summers. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you all to Dr. Jennifer Murray. Take it away, Jennifer. Abby, thank you so kindly for that introduction and thank you for having me. And thanks for everyone joining us tonight on this presentation. I'll go ahead and screen share and Abby, if you could just give me the thumbs up again, that looks good. We... Y'all can see my PowerPoint slide. I presume everything looks good on my end. So we'll go ahead and dive in. We have tonight an opportunity to talk about my first book, Abby mentioned, entitled On a Great Battlefield. The cover of it is on my PowerPoint slide here. And I'm particularly excited to be talking about this topic with the Adams County Historical Society. What a perfect fit. And I look forward to walking with you all um, tonight through some of the key points and findings in my book. I want to start with a, a comment that elaborates just a bit on the introduction that Abby offered. I am from Western Maryland. I grew up in Western Maryland, and my association to the Gettysburg battlefield date back to uh, 2002, actually. So 20 years ago this summer, I started working for the National Park Service as an intern, and I ended up through my undergraduate degree, my master's degree, and through my PhD program at Auburn University, coming back to Gettysburg every summer to work for the National Park Service. I worked there from 2002 to 2010. So this battlefield, the story of the battle, the men, the soldiers, the officers who fought there is something that's very, very deeply ingrained to me personally and certainly professionally. So I look forward tonight to sharing with you some interesting information about my book and hopefully give you another layer to understanding the Gettysburg battlefield. This topic tonight originated as my dissertation. And when I was studying at Auburn as a PhD candidate, we're supposed to produce a dissertation, which is a, a, a work of original scholarship. 
And I was thinking about what I wanted to write on through coursework and I had some different ideas in mind. None was really catching me yet for dissertation. But one summer when I was working at Gettysburg, I stumbled across a collection of the National Park Service era in the 1930s, right when the National Park Service acquired the battlefield. And I ended up writing a short research paper on this topic. Uh, I didn't quite understand it at that time, but that it grew or sort of expanded into being my dissertation topic. You all are Gettysburg scholars and no doubt you can think of dozens and dozens of books that's been written on this three day battle, 72 hours in American history, the largest bloodiest battle in the American Civil War. And in fact, there are over 18,000 books written on the Battle of Gettysburg, 18,000 books written on the Battle of Gettysburg. What my book offers then is not a study of the battle or the campaign, but a history of the Gettysburg battlefield. So I was interested in questions about how the battlefield was preserved, how the battlefield has been interpreted over time, how the battlefield has become commercialized, the ways in which the American people respond or understand the Battle of Gettysburg and Lincoln's Gettysburg Address and the way in which this battle permeates our collective consciousness. Even today, the National Park Service at Gettysburg receives over a million visitors, making it the most popular Civil War site in the National Park Service holding. So that's what I wanna walk through with you all tonight. And no doubt some familiar images here on the screen. The image on the left is George Gordon Meade, my current research topic, uh, dominated, if you will, by the famous National Tower that went up in the mid 1970s. The image on the top right is an aerial view taken in 1941 of the second day battlefield. And specifically, if you all can see my cursor here, we're looking at the intersection of Wheatfield Road and the Emmitsburg Road. We're right in the area of the peach orchard, minus the actual peach trees here in this photograph. And then the image on the bottom right is a contemporary image of Cemetery Ridge. So we'll walk through the history of the battlefield tonight. And I wanna preface my comments, which will really focus on the National Park Service era, the 20th century. But I wanna preface those comments with some thoughts about early preservation efforts at Gettysburg. We know the Battle of Gettysburg to be the bloodiest battle in the Civil War. I've already mentioned that. It eclipses 51,000 casualties between George Meade's Army of the Potomac and Robert E. Lee's Army in Northern Virginia. Those three days fought in Adams County are the bloodiest campaign, the largest battle of the American Civil War. And it will be at, at this battlefield in which Abraham Lincoln will come to insert meaning into these casualties, and he will come to insert meaning into the trajectory and the nature of the war. Veterans in the years after the Battle of Gettysburg will come to commemorate that battlefield where they fought and to honor the men who gave, as Lincoln will tell us, the last full measure of devotion. No doubt you all have toured the battlefield extensively. Some of these images I'll show you tonight are familiar. You can think about the war's impact on civilians, the people who lived in Gettysburg and in Adams County, this is a famous image of the wreckage of the 9th Massachusetts artillery battery at the Trossel Farm, how the hard hand of war impacted the civilians in this community. The Battle of Gettysburg, as we know, is a Union victory. George Meade, who took command of the Army of the Potomac on June 28th, led the Army of the Potomac to its most significant victory to date. He defeated Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia. On July the 6th, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the headline of that newspaper, Meade's Hometown, captures the essence of the Union Army's success when the headline reads, Waterloo Eclipsed. And I've exerted that particular passage from the Philadelphia Inquirer here on the right. And I make this point, and I, I certainly dive into this on my study with George Meade, 
Waterloo eclipsed is important language in 1863. Waterloo is a battle that's in the recent memory of Civil War era Americans. It's fought in 1815. So when the Philadelphia Inquirer makes a comparison to Waterloo, the battle in which Napoleon was defeated, a decisive battle that completely changes the geopolitical situation in Western Europe. They're prescribing a particular kind of meaning to Gettysburg and to that Union victory. The image that we're looking at here, no doubt a familiar one, these are Confederate dead. Union and Confederate soldiers are alike, are buried on the battlefield where they fell in these shallow, somewhat haphazard temporary graves. And that will be the resting place for Union and Confederate soldiers until the governor of Pennsylvania, Andrew Curtin, comes to Gettysburg. He, he tours, if, if you'll allow that word, he tours the, the battlefield. And he's a little concerned to see Union soldiers buried in such a state. So the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania will buy land and set aside land on Cemetery Hill for the creation of the, the Soldiers National Cemetery. And we're looking at a series of images here from the National Cemetery from Dedication Day on November 19th, 1863. Abraham Lincoln leaves Washington, D.C. just a handful of times during the war. And here he travels to Gettysburg. He stays in the Wills House the night before, and he delivers a speech that's just over 200 words on a cold, blustery November day. And in delivering the Gettysburg Address, Lincoln gives the Union war dead meaning. He talks about what the Civil War means, freedom, government of the people, by the people, shall not perish for the earth. And he delivers the Gettysburg Address in Pennsylvania at Gettysburg. And that will here and after attach a particular meaning to the battle, to the landscape, and to our memory of it. So what I aim to do this evening is walk through the three phases of the history of the battlefield. And I've given you a kind of a primer slide here that allows us to look at these three entities that preserve Gettysburg, starting with the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association. I'll refer to it as the GBMA, which will take control of the battlefield in 1864 and hold it until 1895, when the United States War Department steps in and the US War Department, the federal government will manage the battlefield until 1933, at which point Gettysburg and several other Civil War battlefields will be transferred to the National Park Service stewardship, of course, the agency that preserves the battlefield today. The bulk of my research and indeed my book focuses on the National Park Service, but I wanna give us a little bit of context from the GBMA and the War Department so we can better understand this transition in 1933 and understand some of the successes and challenges that the National Park Service has faced in the last 80, 90 years. No doubt many of you listening tonight are familiar with the GBMA. This is the first wartime, well, first Gettysburg preservation entity. And when the battlefield is preserved by the GBMA through an authorization from the state of Pennsylvania, this is 1864. And I always encourage us just to pause a minute and sort of let that date sink in, in that the Civil War is still going on. And in fact, the worst of the war is yet to come with the Overland Campaign, the desperate fighting in Virginia, the maneuvers down through Atlanta, Sherman's March to the Sea, the war is really escalating in 1864 and the outcome is, is far from being decided. But the local Gettysburg leadership, people like David McConaughey, the local lawyer in town, believes in preserving parts of the battlefield at Gettysburg. They have the first grassroots preservation effort and the objective is simple. 
David McConaughey says there could be no more fitting and expressive memorial of the valor and triumphs of our army, the Army of the Potomac, than the battlefield itself. So here we are looking over the fields of Pickett's Charge and thus begins the early preservation efforts of the GBMA. In the two decades that the GBMA preserves Gettysburg, that they're in charge of managing the battlefield, they will secure 522 acres of land, 522 acres of land, mostly land of which the Union Army held as their battle line, so mostly land along the Union Army's battle line. They will also oversee the placement and erection of some of the battlefield's first monuments, like this monument in my image on the left to the first Minnesota in the National Cemetery and the image on the bottom right to the Soldiers National Monument in the National Cemetery. And the GBMA will be responsible for outlining and laying the earliest park avenues, um, the earliest access to, to tour or to roam through the battlefield. So the GBMA does well, but they're constrained by a lack of funding for the sort of vision that they want to preserve the battlefield beyond the 522 acres. So in 1895, the GBMA will deed its land to the US War Department. And the timing here is noteworthy. The timing is opportune. All the uh, circular photographs I have on this slide represent the five a golden age of battlefield preservation, as um, Civil War historian, um, University of Tennessee Martin Tim Smith says, these are the first five federally preserved Civil War battlefields. Chickamauga, Chattanooga, Antietam, Shiloh, Gettysburg, legislation introduced by Dan Sickles, and then Vicksburg to round out in 1899. This is a period in American history of reconciliation. This is when Reconstruction is behind, is over, and Northern, white Northerners, white Southerners are looking towards reconciling. Many US Confederate veterans are eager to put the horrors of the war behind them and start to look towards the future, towards reconciliation. Uh, David Blight's great work on race and reunion gives us an insight into this. Civil War veterans now hold position in Congress, so this allows for federal funding to come to these kinds of preservation activities. And if you could drop yourself in Gettysburg on the battlefield, say here in 1893, this is an image of Union and Confederate veterans on East Cemetery Hill. And I've outlined some of the names, more famous names, more famous faces. Oliver Otis Howard here, of course, uh, Longstreet in the center, E.P. Alexander off to our left, his right, Dan Sickles, probably needs no introduction right here to our right, Longstreet's left, um, Confederate General William Mahone. See some famous people here in this particular image. If you could drop yourself in this image, in this conversation, what would these men be talking about? They would be talking about the Battle of Gettysburg, of course, they'd be talking about where their units fought. They would be talking about a particular attack made on July the 2nd or a position held on July the 2nd. They would be sharing war stories like grizzly old veterans do. What they would not be talking about are the war's more controversial issues. You would not hear discussions of secession or slavery or reconstruction or Jim Crow laws that so very much permeated late 19th century America. This is a unification that brings the white North and the white South back together, that the animus of the war has long been forgotten. And I give you that context because it will be important to understand this interpretive shift in the early part of the 21st century that happens at Gettysburg, this interpretive shift that seeks to realign or correct this very narrative given out 
from the veterans in the late 19th century. The War Department preserves the Gettysburg battlefield with specific objection, uh, objectives in mind. The War Department first and foremost, like the GBMA, seeks to preserve the battlefield as a memorial to the men who fought and died at Gettysburg. Preservation as a memorial to the men who fought and died at Gettysburg. They seek to further erect additional monuments. They seek to mark unit positions. And so much of that plays out through the turn of the century. 50 years after the Battle of Gettysburg, President Woodrow Wilson will come to Pennsylvania, come to Adams County to celebrate the Peace Jubilee. And here he is in this image flanked by a Union and Confederate veteran. This is a manifestation of the sentiment of reconciliation. The governor of Virginia, William Hodges Mann, will be here in Adams County in Gettysburg for the 50th anniversary. And he delivers a, a pretty lengthy address of which I have just one excerpt from to share where Governor Mann says, we're not here to discuss the, the genesis, the origins of the war. Instead, we came here to talk over the events of the battle man to man. So the tactics, the heroism, the courage and honor of Union and Confederate soldiers alike, what everyone can agree on, the battlefield is a symbol of heroism, a symbol of courage, whether you're wearing blue or whether you're wearing gray. And the high tide of that reconciliation sentiment comes of course with the famous hands across the wall where veterans from Pickett's division here on the right of course will shake hands with members of the Philadelphia Brigade Association in this tangible moment of reconciliation. The very ground where 50 years earlier they will be fighting desperately at the angle in that big climactic frontal assault of Pickett's charge. This is the height of reconciliation. And that moves us into the 20th century. After the 50th anniversary, we're, we're sliding into this third period of the parks administrative history when the National Park Service will step in. But I wanted to share um, two additional slides before we make that transition. I mentioned to you that the primary focus of both the GBMA and the War Department is to preserve the battlefield as a memorial to those who fought. For the War Department, a second objective is to find a utilitarian value in holding these grounds. And that utilitarian value comes in using Gettysburg as a training ground for modern day military officers. The image on the right is West Point's class of 1902. You can see the O2 configuration of their hats here, standing at the high water mark. And the two images on the right, the one on the top, and I'll show you a follow-up of this, is a image from Camp Colt. And we can see the young Dwight David Eisenhower here. Y'all can see my cursor moving up and down. Eisenhower, of course, in charge of Camp Colt. And then the bottom right image are US Marines doing some drills and maneuvering on the battlefield. So the War Department sees these large, vast grounds, some 2,500 acres at this time, as an opportunity to train the subsequent generations of military officers. Camp Colt perfectly personifies this. This is where Eisenhower will get his initial introduction to Gettysburg, of course, preferring to be on the Western Front as the war is escalating. He is here in Gettysburg running the tank. And if you can imagine tanks on the fields of Pickett's Charge out near where uh, the Bliss property was, at least until July 2nd and 3rd, this is the heart of Camp Colt. So utilitarian uses. And we'll see 
the National Park Service continued that trend. So in 1933, the National Park Service will assume control of the Gettysburg battlefield from the War Department. And I wanna make a point here that's incredibly important. And as a historian, as a professor, we always think about contextualizing history. And this is vitally important for the history of the Gettysburg battlefield. The timing here is August, 1933. The president of the United States the President of the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt, in the midst of the Great Depression and the New Deal, when the National Park Service acquires Gettysburg, they acquire not only the Gettysburg battlefield, but 57 other historic sites. All the other Civil War sites, Shiloh, Chickamauga, Chattanooga, Antietam, and Vicksburg that we talked about a couple slides ago, now come under the purview of the National Park Service. And when I was doing my research back as a, a PhD student, I was really surprised, and I didn't expect to find this to this extent, in the way in which contemporary events, political, cultural, social, economic, that's going on in the United States, dictate how the Gettysburg battlefield is managed. This man here is the first National Park Service superintendent. And his name is James McConaughey, um, spelled with an I-E, James McConaughey. And he is a Harvard-educated man um, in landscape architecture. So he comes to manage Gettysburg with a background in landscape architecture. How can we manage Gettysburg, not so much as a historic battlefield, but as a landscape? And it will be McConaughey who will oversee the National Park Service transition and he will oversee these enormous logistical infrastructure changes and improvements during the 1930s. And here's where timing matters. One of Roosevelt's prime New Deal programs, those alphabet agencies is the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC. And there are millions of young men who take positions in the CCC all across the nation, all sorts of parks, federal parks, state parks, and Gettysburg will house two CCC camps. The first one opens at Pitzer Woods. Look on the top right, Pitzer Woods will open a camp in June of 1933, and then McMillan Woods, so we're along the Confederate side of the battlefield along Seminary Ridge, McMillan Woods, will open the second CCC camp later that year in November. And what the CCC does at Gettysburg is modernize the battlefield. So if you could drop yourself in Gettysburg on the battlefield, say in 1935 or 1937, you would see scores of workers on the battlefield cleaning monuments like we're looking at here along the Wheatfield Road. You would see CCC workers doing other infrastructure improvements. Here, they're erecting and painting, at least in the image on the left, the Lafayette Square fencing, which initially comes to Gettysburg in the late 1880s and is placed on East Cemetery Hill, but is now relocated to divide the Evergreen Cemetery, the Civilian Cemetery, from the Soldiers National Cemetery. Those are the kind of projects that they would do. They'll do some work on the roads, um, all the modern infrastructure that we think of today to facilitate our visitor experience really lies in the work done, not only by the CCC, but some other New Deal agencies like the WPA and the PWA. So this is a, a real inflection point in the history of the Gettysburg battlefield for modernizing the park. And before I leave this slide, and you might even have noticed it on the last slide, but Gettysburg CCC camps are unique. They're noteworthy because the enrollees are African-American. That itself isn't necessarily exceptional in that other 
state parks and national parks have African-American enrollees, but what separates Gettysburg um, apart is that the overseer of the CCC camp is also an African-American. And that's deliberately selected by Roosevelt and his staff to make sure that Black Americans during the Great Depression have equal access to these sorts of New Deal opportunities. And what better place to test those racial policies than at Gettysburg, the landscape that Lincoln tells us gave a new birth of freedom to all Americans. So I encourage you to think about the New Deal era as a transformative one in modernizing the battlefield. So what we'll do, you can get a little flavor of this already tonight, is jump through these inflection points. So I, I always say when I'm giving a talk on my book to think of this as, as uh, the greatest hits, you know, the one album greatest hits of the Gettysburg battlefield. I wanna give you a taste of these moments that really change or stand out in the history of the park from 1863 to the present day. And one such era, of course, is World War II. Roosevelt's New Deal doesn't end the Great Depression. We know that. What ends the Great Depression is the Second World War. And I wasn't sure what to expect out of Gettysburg and the battlefield during World War II, but I found it to be one of the most interesting periods of years um, in my entire research project. And the battlefield will be affected by World War II in, in a variety of ways. Um, one way, and this is a, a tangible way, is that the National Park Service at Gettysburg will donate thousands, thousands of pounds of scrap metal. And we can see two images here of the park staff overseeing some workers to donate some of these surplus or ornamental features of the battlefield. And if you think about the context, flip to this slide for a second, think of the context here. Roosevelt has promised the American people and our allies that the United States would become, uh, quote, an arsenal of democracy. So in order to be an arsenal of democracy, we have to have the resources to make these liberty ships, like you see in the image on the right. And I picked this image deliberately. Look at the ship's name here. This is the, the Lincoln Victory. Love that throwback to Lincoln and the importance of the Civil War. So the battlefield will collect um, somewhere around 18,000 tons. Vicksburg does this too, as does Chickamauga, Chattanooga, and donate to the scrap drive, tangible contribution of the Second World War. Because Roosevelt has curtailed traveling, or for instance, our restrictions on travel, um, leisure travel at least during World War II, the battlefield is not well visited in the 1940s, um, early 1940s at least. So what you would primarily see are soldiers using the battlefield much like the men did during the War Department as a training ground, as an outdoor classroom to see how they could learn lessons of leadership and bravery. Here, we're looking at some new recruits. There's our park ranger giving them a talk. He's got his uh, broadcasting system set up. And we are, of course, on East Cemetery Hill. And you can also see if you look over to the right, the old Cyclorama building. So soldiers, primarily the visitors to the battlefield. Here they are in 1943 doing a training exercise out on the field of Pickett's Charge. You can see the Kadori farm off on the top left. You can see all the um, trappings of modernity that used to be on these fields. These are the telephone poles that were here until the 1990s, one of the friend's first, um, and in my opinion, most significant projects on the fields of Pickett's Charge. So Edgewood Arsenal Chemical Warfare Group. The National Park Service at Gettysburg will also um, house a prisoner of war camp for German POWs. And I never have seen a really good image of that camp, so I didn't include it in my PowerPoint, but yet another way 
that the landscape serves a utilitarian or practical purpose, the German POW camp. And one other point that comes out of the Second World War I wanna mention before we move to the, into the 1950s and 60s is the way in which Americans experience a resurgence or a, a revitalization of Abraham Lincoln. Historical figures have trends or historical eras have trends who come and go, ebbs and flows, highs and lows. And the Second World War sees a resurgence of popularity of Lincoln and to the Gettysburg Address. This propaganda image is encouraging Americans to think of Pearl Harbor, remember December 7th, 1941, look at the tattered flag. And then at the top, we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. So a deliberate effort for current Americans, 1941, 1942, to think of the past, think of Lincoln, think of the sacrifices made at Gettysburg. And again, make those kind of commitments, that kind of resolution for freedom and democracy in our country and around the globe. This image is actually one from World War I, but it, it furthers the point that I'm making about the government harnessing Lincoln here used to buy Liberty Bonds and extracting a passage from the Gettysburg Address. And I encourage you thinking of Lincoln and the Gettysburg Address in the 1940s to really read that line anew. Gary Wills and his work on the Gettysburg Address says that it's, it's timeless because you can breathe life into the Gettysburg Address. Each generation read it as they needed to and got out of it what they needed to to fit the era that they're living in. So when you think of government of the people, by the people, for the people, in a period where freedom and liberty and democracy is being vanquished or threatened around the globe from fascists and Nazism and totalitarian regimes, Lincoln and Gettysburg really resonate, really resonate. And Americans are eager to, to turn back to 1863 and make that connection to the past. So that takes us into the middle part of the 20th century. World War II, the closure of World War II, victory in Europe, victory in Japan, means that the late 1940s and into the early middle 1950s see a surge of visitation to Gettysburg. This is the period of modern commercialization and I've extracted just a handful of modern, uh, modern vis-a-vis -vis 1950s, modern commercial establishments to give you a sample of what commercialism on the battlefield looked like post-World War II. No doubt some familiar images. The one on the top right, the little larger one, this is Route 30, the Chambersburg Pike. Here you can see the monument, John Fulton Reynolds, John Buford. Off to the right would be the Comfort Station and the rest stop. The Peace Light Inn, we're also out on the first day's battlefield, read the sign for cocktails, seafood, and beer. The Home Sweet Home Motel was on Steinware Route 15 until the modern era. I remember the summer that that work was being demolished. The Lee Mead Inn, my bottom right image, um, on the Emmitsburg Road on the south end of the battlefield, the day two fighting through the 1950s. So all variety of modernity on the battlefield. And you think about post-World War II, the economic boom experienced during President Eisenhower's administration, more Americans have a automobile now than ever before, and Americans are eager to visit national parks to make this connection to their history. And you see in this period also, and this will springboard us to the centennial, Americans become uniquely interested in the Civil War. I'm sure many of you are members of Civil War roundtable groups, um, perhaps the one in Gettysburg, the Civil War roundtables take their origins to the 1950s. This is also the period 
in which reenacting becomes in vogue. The North-South Skirmish Association formed in the late 1950s. So this, uh, the, the term is Civil War subculture, really begins not only to creep, but it's more of a tidal wave into America's entertainment and educational discourse. Americans are becoming energized and interested in the Civil War. And that tide, that tide of Civil War subculture carries us into the Civil War centennial. And I would encourage you to reflect here in this image on the 1960s as a period of simultaneous collision between the Civil War centennial and the civil rights movement. So the image on the right, Civil War Centennial stamp, this is a commission, the Civil War Centennial Commission set up um, initially by Dwight David Eisenhower, but then chaired by Ulysses S. Grant III to oversee the commemorations or celebrations, two different words, two different meanings, commemorations and celebrations of the centennial. At the same time that America is experiencing tremendous social, political unrest with the civil rights movement. And the image on the left is one of the bus burnings, uh, this in Anniston, Alabama, of the Freedom Riders in the early 1960s. So Civil War Centennial meets civil rights movement, gets for a, a period in American history with all sorts of threads and narratives moving uh, concurrently. The National Park Service at Gettysburg kind of winds up for the centennial a few years earlier. And there's a variety of activity that's going on a few years prior to 63. Here in September 1961, the state of Georgia will dedicate her state monument at Gettysburg. Uh, the following day, Georgia delegates will go down to Antietam in Maryland and dedicate a similar monument. So this is the period when you drive down South Confederate, West Confederate Avenue, and you see all the Confederate state monuments that so many of them go up. So many of them will go up during the centennial and then into the 1970s. Gettysburg is featured in different television programs, news, um, news specials, magazines, the President of the United States visits Gettysburg in March of 1963. I've drawn a couple photographs here from President Kennedy's visit on Little Round Top, over at the North Carolina Monument. That one monument predates the centennial by um, two and a half, three decades. So President Kennedy's visit in March. The National Park Service at Gettysburg has been preparing for the centennial in a variety of ways. One, which manifests itself with the opening of a visitor center. Um, more recently, of course, we know the name of this building to be the Cyclorama Center, but when it opens in 1962, it is the visitor center and it takes the National Park Service operations, um, which had been on Baltimore Pike operating out of the post office building into their own center uh, featured museum, visitor contact station, and of course, the, the um, display of Paul Philippoteau's Cyclorama building. So this is an aerial view, and you can see the Cyclorama Center here on the right, and then all the white dots are hundreds and hundreds of cars at a obviously very busy day here in 1962. This building designed by Richard Neutra, the famous architect. So the opening of the new building um, springboards Gettysburg, the Park Service to the centennial. And starting in late June 18, 1963, there will be a variety of distinguished speakers and guests in town and on the battlefield. There will be a variety of monument dedications or rededications. And you can read through so many of these speeches. They're in the park archives. 
and see what people are saying, you know, in July, late June of 1963, how they're reflecting on the Civil War 100 years earlier, or as the New Jersey governor does here, how he connects that reflection to the more current and immediate issues of race and equality in the United States of America. And here in the New Jersey governor says the Civil War was not fought to preserve Union Lily White or Jim Crow, it was fought for liberty and justice for all. That image, of course, one of the sit-in boycotts in the early 1960s. So my point here is how 1963 Americans think about the Civil War, but also how they view the Civil War in regards to current events playing out around them. How they look at Gettysburg, how they come to understand that battle or the Gettysburg Address vis-a-vis -vis the world in which they live in. In the 1960s, an incredibly volatile period, socially, um, domestically, and of course, with a heightened Cold War internationally. So I wanted to mention one other visitor that comes to Gettysburg for the centennial, and this is George Wallace here on the more left side of the image. Wallace will lay a wreath at the Alabama Monument, and he will be present at the dedication of the monument for the South Carolina soldiers. And he also attends the first National Park Service sponsored campfire. If any of you have ever been to the amphitheater for our evening campfire programs, uh, George Wallace was in attendance for the inaugural one. So thinking of George Wallace coming to Gettysburg as governor of Alabama, just weeks after he stood in the schoolhouse door at the University of Alabama to find integration at that state institution of higher education, he comes to Gettysburg with a particular background and message and, and purpose that he wants to share with listeners. The image on the right, Wallace and Joy's visit is from the July 3rd, 1963 um, Gettysburg Times newspaper declaring that the governor is having a good time at the centennial observations. In the second paragraph, he says, I think I'm safer here than at home, speaking about political em enemies. So Pennsylvanians are good Yankees, he says. So the Civil War centennial is also the first time that the National Park Service eclipses a million and then two million visitors, over two million Americans, will come to Gettysburg in 1964. Over 2 million Americans coming in, or, or visitors rather, visitors, not just Americans, of course, coming into to the National Park Service to visit the battlefield. That is an incredible surge of visitation. But for all practical purposes, and we're moving into my, kind of my last era here, and I'm mindful of my time too. For all practical purposes, the Civil War Centennial and the Civil Rights Movement didn't change the way the National Park Service interpreted the battlefield or the way you as a visitor would experience it. There wasn't any cataclysmic shift in regards to the interpretive philosophy, the battlefield. That changes in the late 20th century into the 21st century when the National Park Service gets a new superintendent at Gettysburg, that is Dr. John Latcher, who will arrive to the battlefield in the summer of 1994. Uh, Latcher is a um, academic, he has a PhD in history from Rutgers, and he is also a military veteran. So he's serving in the United States Army. So he comes to Gettysburg with this unique background as both a military veteran and an academic, and he shepherds Gettysburg into this new period and this new era, one of which will be a change in how the National Park Service interprets the battle and the Civil War. This will overlap with the congressional directive in 2000. Some of you no doubt followed all this very closely because it's it's recent history, if, if you will, 20 years old, recent history, um, stemming from Congressman Jesse Jackson's 
frustration that he could visit a battlefield in Mississippi like Vicksburg and only learn about the battle and the soldiers there, that you couldn't visit Vicksburg, for instance, and learn any context to the battle or anything about the war's causes and consequences. So to remedy that, in 2000, the United States Congress issued a directive that Civil War battle sites managed by the federal government would recognize in all of their displays and media presentations the unique role that the institution of slavery played in causing the Civil War and what role at that particular battle site. So when I encouraged you to think about reconciliation slides ago and about those Union Confederate veterans on East Cemetery Hill having conversations about the soldiers and the units that they were in, the attacks they made or the attacks that they repulsed. And I said, there's no discourse in this period of reconciliation. Now, with this new interpretive trajectory, the National Park Service includes discussions of slavery, the failures of reconstruction. And the platform to do that was the new visitor center and museum. This had been in the makings for about 14 years by the time it opens in April of 2008. Uh, it's a public-private partnership. It cost over $105 million. And you can now, and I'm sure many of you with me tonight, with us tonight, have been in the old visitor center, in the new visitor center. The differences are stark and apparent. Whereas you walk into the, the, the new visitor center, the current building, and you can go through the galleries and follow the entire trajectory of the Civil War. Of course, Gettysburg still dominates the majority of the galleries and the displays, but you can get a sense of the Civil War in the broader picture. This, and no doubt many of you know this, we've lived it, was fiercely controversial. One of the most interesting periods of the National Park Service tenure for me to research was this period. If you write a letter to the park superintendent, it's part of the public record. So I was able to go into the archives and read thousands of letters from a cross section of Americans, coast to coast, north, south, east, west, opining or giving their thoughts on what the new interpretive museum was like or how Gettysburg should be preserved. Some favor it, some oppose it. Jerry uh, Russell, the leading preservationist out of Arkansas says very famously, battlefields are about honor. And he projected that talking about slavery at a place like Gettysburg would give or reflect a uh, cataclysmic shift in how we understood the Civil War. So the new visitor center, incredibly, incredibly controversial. And it shifts the interpretive trajectory. Now the National Park Service focuses on a theme called a new birth of freedom, a new birth of freedom. Perhaps though, and this will be my final group of slides, perhaps that was for many Americans at least, less controversial than what was going on on the battlefield itself. And this is the rehabilitation or restoration program multi-year that the National Park Service undertook under the Latcher administration. Part of that involves um, tearing down or demolishing non-historic structures, perhaps most famously the National Tower or the Ottenstein Tower that goes up in the summer of 1974. And I've pulled one of uh, famous Bruce Catton quote where he calls it an outrage. I hope that one day people will come to their senses. In the image on the left, you can see it being constructed. It was at 309 or 310 feet called a cash register in the sky. This is an editorial from the Wilkes-Barre newspaper, uh, Pennsylvania, bad taste at Gettysburg. Very controversial when it goes up close to the Soldiers National Cemetery, visible from all parts of the battlefield. And then, and this is perhaps the, the takeaway from Gettysburg, it's controversial when it goes down. This is a sequence of photos from July 3rd of 2000. So if you visited the Gettysburg battlefield in recent years, 
you would have seen some of these changes yourself. This is a photograph from um, sort of the outskirts of Devil's Den, if you will, along the trolley path, looking west towards the Confederate line. So in the heart of the day two action. And it captures for us some of these restoration projects. Um, the National Park Service aimed to to uh, reclaim about 500 and some acres, closer to 600 acres of non-historic woodlots. And this was like the visitor center, but perhaps more so fiercely debated. I give you a quote um, about tree clearing. Gettysburg is not the National Arboretum. It's, a, it's not a bird sanctuary clearing trees to restore the battlefield to the vistas of 1862, 1863 is exactly the right thing to do. By contrast, some people thought that visitors didn't care to what the battlefield looked like in 1863. So the objective is to provide you and I, the visitors, a sense of what Union and Confederate soldiers saw during those three days of fighting, that we can understand fields of fire, we can understand attacks, we can understand how soldiers maneuvered on the battlefield. This is a shot of Devil's Den from the slider lane, August 4, uh, 2007, this photograph was taken. And this is what it looked like later that year, September of 2007. For me, I mentioned working at Gettysburg during this time, this was um, just fascinating to watch. I would leave in August to go back down to school, either in Virginia or down to Auburn, and then come back in May to start getting ready to work for the summer and see these changes play out was, was absolutely incredible. And leading thousands of tours, tens of thousands of visitors across the battlefield during that period, it absolutely changes how you understand the battle. You can understand now fields of fire. This is up near Smith's Gun on Devil's Den looking towards the Confederate line, what you would see before the clearing and then after can understand that attack so much better on the afternoon of July the 2nd. National Park Service doing great work with this kind of restoration, extensive restoration. More cutting down on the south end of the battlefield. We're here in the kind of in the parking lot area of Devil's Den, looking of course towards Little Round Top. This is the 44th New York. This is one of the holdovers from the Great Depression New Deal project. They cut all this area, these non-historic woodlots, left that visit uh, restroom comfort station there. And then in the spring of 2010, went back and demolished that. This work is absolutely incredible and it's ongoing. You know, it, it culminated with perhaps the removal of the old visitor center, if you will. This is the one the Park Service acquired in the 1970s, situated directly across the street on Tawny Town Road from the Soldiers National um, Cemetery, which will be demolished uh, months after the new visitor center opened in 2008. This is demolished in 2009. So that area is now being restored. And then right on the eve of the Susquecentennial in March of 2013, this image is taken specifically on March the 9th. The Cyclorama Center in Ziegler's Grove is destroyed. So it allowed for the National Park Service with the, the opening of the new visitor center in 2008 to restore land that was held, um, the Union Army's battle line and part of the fighting during the battle to restore it to its 1863 configuration. And if you are roaming the battlefield in the recent years, you yourself would have seen these changes which are, which are absolutely remarkable and give us a, a much better appreciation for the battle and the men who fought there and died at Gettysburg. So I'll leave you with just this last slide. Of course, it's a Michigan monument that I have a Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain quote, uh, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain quote with a Michigan monument. In great deeds, something abides and on great fields, something stays. So I hope that my program tonight has given you a little bit of nuance to understand the Gettysburg battlefield beyond those three hot days in July of 1863 to understand the landscape's history over generations and over decades 
and what it means to Americans across time. I, I will look forward to engaging with you in the chat. Please ask some questions or drop some comments in. I'll look forward to hearing from you in that forum. But otherwise, thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you to the Adams County Historical Society for having me. Jennifer, that was wonderful. I really enjoyed um, hearing about the different periods over the course of the, of the battlefield. And it's important because we, we can see the battlefield today and we know what the soldiers did, but it's hard to kind of see in the middle and bringing up the different periods. And uh, that was fascinating to me. So I um, really appreciate your, your pictures and your slides and your insight, most of all. Um, thank you so much for joining us um, to do a presentation for us. It was wonderful. Now, to my audience, I want to thank you all for joining us again for a Thursday night program. Uh, we do these every Thursday at seven o'clock. So if you come back to the Facebook page next Thursday, there will be another one. Um, thank you to those who donated tonight. It was um, greatly appreciated. And again, we try to keep that um, so we keep our programs free and accessible. And it's really uh, very helpful as we um, start to move forward to our new museum, um, which if y'all didn't know, has some periods of early battlefield commemoration. We're going to be featuring some of that. So um, to piggyback on Jen, um, Jen's wonderful talk, um, hopefully here soon, we'll have a really nice museum that kind of features a couple of those aspects as well. Um, so Jennifer, any last thoughts for us tonight? I, I don't have any. I look forward to seeing what our audience has to say in the, in the chat, no doubt familiar images and stories to, to so many who visited this battlefield many times and walked many, many miles across it. So um, I, again, thank you for having me. Thank you all for listening. And I'm excited to see what your comments and thoughts are um, in the chat. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jen. Thank you to everybody watching. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the night. We'll see you next Thursday.